Okay, great. So it's really great to be here. Thanks everyone who came. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about sysrev.com, the first open access document curation platform. Uh, we talk about this a lot on Twitter. You can follow me at Tom Liu, or you can follow sysrev at sysrev1. And we also post lots of blog posts about new feature releases, interesting projects, all that kind of stuff at uh, blog.sysrev.com. So I'm just going to jump into it. Um, again, thank you all for coming here. Hopefully I have some interesting information for you. So CISREV helps do structured review. Uh, what is a structured review? Some of you might be familiar with this, but it's useful to review a structured review briefly. Uh, the first step in a structured review is collecting a whole bunch of documents. Uh, when you're collecting documents, those might be from places like PubMed, or you, know, you might be uploading PDFs, or you might have some sort of custom data source. Uh, you know, some big XML document you have, an interesting database like clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, really, CISREV is trying to generalize this process of creating a big bucket of documents. Uh, so the first step in structure review is collecting a whole, whole lot of documents to review, and then designing some sort of uh, review tasks. You're going to be answering questions like, uh, you know, which drugs were mentioned in an article? Uh, did you like this document or not like that document? Uh, which companies were mentioned? Uh, and you could even highlight a company and annotate it in a document. So those are review tasks, and they can be really varied. Uh, CISREV helps to distribute those tasks to human reviewers, and it does so in a way to optimize machine learning. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, CISREV is making it easy to recruit a whole bunch of people and uh, have those people look at documents, automate the distribution of those documents to people, and have machines try to automate all of the tasks that those, peoples are, uh, that those people are doing. And finally, you're going to collect all of those results into a, into a spreadsheet or programmatically and use them somehow. So I think it's it's useful to stop for a second and talk about why our team uh, is passionate about systematic review, uh, structured review at CISREF. Uh, you might be aware that we're living in a really unique period in human history. The amount of data in every field is increasing exponentially. Uh, of course, if you look at PubMed, there's something like 30 million abstracts now, and it's increasing something like 10% every year. That's super crazy. Uh, but medical abstracts aren't special. All sorts of documents are increasing at an incredible pace. Uh, so how are people supposed to get a handle on that? It used to be that people could be, you could have a, a renaissance person, uh, someone who understands many fields. Uh, that probably stopped being possible maybe 50 years ago. Um, but people still you know, had, had good mastery of many fields. Uh, it's now not really even possible to have mastery of a single field. Uh, if you're trying to be an expert on medical stents, for example, you'd have to read something like 50,000 articles a year just to stay on top of all of them. <clears throat> you might come back and say, well, I don't need to read all of those articles to be an expert. But the moment you start relying on some sort of application to tell you which articles to look at, the moment you give up mastery of that subject. So you might expect somebody like me to come here and say, you know, we've got a ton of data. We're trying to answer some hard problems. Let's throw AI at it. Uh, but the problem with machine learning and artificial intelligence is, you know, it's really not up to this task uh, yet. Humans are still, uh, you know, much more capable in terms of designing important problems. That's probably the, the most important step, but also designing sub goals, organizing data and generalizing their experience over many different kinds of documents. We really have a, a miraculous machine in our minds. Uh, so CISREV actually aims to integrate people with each other because the limitation people have is that Every individual can only look at, you know, maybe maybe a few thousand articles in a year, something like that. We can only compile and learn from a very limited set of documents. But there are a lot of us, so if we can work together effectively. Uh, we can start answering these hard questions and look at a lot of data. A really good example of using algorithms to help people integrate with each other is the Delta method. Say you were trying to design a nuclear power plant. Uh, you might go to a bunch of nuclear physicists, put them in a room, and say, come up with a, a better power plant design. Um, they might argue for a while and come up with a design. They might do a good job. Um, another way to do it would be to go to all those physicists and say, design your own power plant, and then take all of their designs and come back to those physicists with all the designs and say, rank these designs for me. At the end, you have a big ranked list of designs. And you could even iterate this process and let the physicists learn from each other. This, this example is getting a little involved now, but uh, that's the Delta method. And that's an algorithm that would let you get a ranked list of nuclear power plant designs uh, that you know, ideally would be ranked well without needing to know anything about nuclear, 
power, power plants yourself. Sysrev wants to enable that kind of thing and really all kinds of algorithms to allow people to integrate with each other more effectively. Uh, effective human communication for solving important problems is a, is a really great way for us to start getting a handle on the huge amount of data being generated in many domains. Of course, machine learning plays a role there as well. Uh, so we want to be able to, to allow the machines to do some repetitive and easy tasks and scale them up uh, where possible. But really, our primary goal is the integration of human intelligence. So that's our passion behind this thing. We really think it will touch uh, really every field of knowledge. Uh, if, you, if you think about any situation where people need to make a decision based on evidence, there's a review process there. All right, so let's come up with an example. Uh, we worked with a doctor, Dr. Channing Paller, at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And uh, she was interested in using data to design uh, better combination therapies for cancer. So what data sources might you look at for that? You might pull in PubMed. Uh, you might pull in clinicaltrials.gov and OpenFDA. PubMed would be entirely unstructured. Uh, you're going to read the articles on these drugs that you're interested in and the disease you're interested in and start coming up with ideas about genes and you know, drugs that have been tried and how they affect those genes, all sorts of interesting information you can pull from the unstructured data. Clinicaltrials.gov is semi-structured, uh, so there are still titles and descriptions, um, and even the drugs being used aren't, don't use controlled identifiers yet. Um, but you could start learning from clinicaltrials.gov what, you know, what therapies, what combinations have already been tried. Open FDA is almost entirely structured, uh, so you could start getting information that you wouldn't really have to carefully review, uh, although you might want to combine it with these other data sources on adverse events that might have occurred. Once you've collected your data sources, uh, a place where human intelligence really shines is designing sub-goals. What, what questions do we have to answer design, to design a better combination therapy? We have to know what drugs have already been used together, what adverse events have been observed, which diseases have been treated effectively, uh, which genes are targeted, and maybe even administrative stuff, you know, which companies make which drugs, uh, which people have designed which trials. Of course, once you've answered all those questions with the data, you're still not done. You've collected a whole bunch of data, but you still have to come back and design a better combination therapy. Uh, this is a place where models can help people. Uh, so we designed a very simple algorithm that would look at existing combinations of drugs and say, you know, bevacizumab and erlotinib have been combined and erlotinib has been combined with everolimus. Uh, maybe all three of those could be combined together. So uh, this is kind of a, a very simple graph algorithm. And uh, we ranked clinical trials. Um, we ranked combinations that way. And one of the hidden trials from us was bevacizumab, bevacizumab and Everlimus, and that received very high rank. So the point of this isn't to talk about you know, the research we're doing there. I'm just trying to illustrate the life cycle of one of these review projects and, and the power of being able to answer very important questions with various data sources. OK. So how is CISREV really doing this? I'm going to get into some of the actual, you know, we're going to look at CISREV for one thing and some of the features behind it. Uh, CISREV is a fair platform, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Uh, we try to support those principles. Uh, one way we do that is through open access. So those are a lot of buzzwords, but let's focus on open access for now. Open access means that when you create a project on CISREV, if you're, if you're creating a free project, it has to be a public project. What that means is that anyone can see your project. If you're a developer and you're familiar with GitHub, we're really trying to clone the GitHub model here. Uh, you, can you can create public projects that anybody can see, including search engines. So if I go to sysrev.com slash search, and I hope I have all my tabs set up here correctly, I can search for cancer, and you can see I have 21 projects that have this keyword cancer in them, and I have an organization that has done a project there. Uh, you'll see more and more information on the sysrev search page over time. You can search for other projects as well. We launched last summer, so I think while we do have something like 1,400 public projects now, um, you're not going to find a project for every topic. Um, if you've got a new topic, you can create your own review very quickly. But more importantly, uh, you can discover these projects on Google and Bing. Uh, this is really important for reducing redundancy. So if you go to Prospero, which is a registry for systematic reviews, and you search for lead reviews, uh, you'll find something like 1,000, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 lead reviews. Redundancy is important. It's good that people do the same project over and over again, but we do, it is an opportunity to reduce, uh, you know, unnecessary work. Um, it's not really enough just to have a search engine on a site. Uh, we, need, we need those projects to be discoverable uh, by people who use Google and Bing and all the other internet search engines. 
So if you search for Cicero of Eris, uh, you'll find all the reviews that were done by the Eris Surgical Group. Uh, the search was done a while ago. You can try it right now. Probably still show up somewhere near the top. Um, so that's very discoverable. If you go to Bing and you search Cicero of Gene Hunter, you'll find all the all the uh, you'll find a review we did on extracting genes from the literature. So that's how open access can solve redundancy. But open access actually helps with a lot of other things as well. Uh, if you're if you're trying to uh, if you're trying to teach students how to do this process, um, you might want to just create a review and invite those students to join the review and look at the progress of the review. Dr. Lena Smirnova at Johns Hopkins did this with zebrafish toxicology. She's trying to teach her, her, her students about zebrafish and uh, trying to teach them about the review process as well. So she shares a link, a link on her Coursera course. She can take a look at any time and see the state of her review. Uh, she can see how it's progressing over time. She can see how many students have actually participated in her review. And uh, she can see what kind of information they're extracting. I can get a little long-winded about this, so I'm going to cut it off shortly. But there's a really interesting opportunity in education to leverage the work that students do in the pursuit of learning uh, for other purposes. So these students are trying to learn about zebrafish toxicology, but they can extract useful information, like what outcomes were in a document. So long as you have some way of controlling the quality of their review, uh, that data can be really, really useful. So just to show you what that looks like, this is her project. Uh, you can go there yourself right now, sysrev.com slash p slash 3509. And uh, yeah, you can see all the things I just talked about, review status. Um, actually, it looks like another student just did a, a lot of review. You can see that quite a few students have joined this review over here. And you can see down at the bottom some keywords that are automatically being extracted, but also the data that those students are extracting from these 4,000 documents or so. Uh, the next slide, which I'll skip and just show you here, uh, shows you how you can click on one of these tags and get a link. So if I wanted to know which articles, let me go do that again. If I wanted to know which articles uh, were about the circulatory system, I can click that and I can see there are 63 matching articles. I can see which student uh, reviewed which article and what information they extracted from that article. Uh, this is really important because if someone asks me, and, and I'll give you an example of this, we did a review of clinical trials with a clinician. And uh, she asked me one day, you know, how many of the trials we reviewed, we reviewed uh, uh, used the placebo? And I could try to tell her from memory, or I could just give her a link. And that link will have the number in it. Eventually, you'll be able to embed those links in articles. And that gives you a way to uh, use open access to create a higher quality of, uh, of data control and, the communica and, and communication. So I can click on one of these articles that a student has reviewed, and I can see exactly what kind of information they're extracting. And there you, you can see at the bottom, outcomes, circulatory system being reviewed by this student. OK. So these are the slides that I was going to skip. Basically, this is the project. You can see there's a link right at the bottom. We can click that link and see exactly uh, which articles have a, a, a cardio system outcome. Sysref also supports auditability. You actually just saw an example of that, but, uh, but this is worth thinking about for just a moment. Um, what that means is that if, if you're reviewing a document uh, and you're extracting a whole lot of information for that document, for people to trust that you're doing that right, they need to be able to see who reviewed which documents and which, what data they reviewed. Sysref lets you do that with a link. Here you can see that process playing out in a review on the effects on liver as observed in experimental animals. Uh, this is a project done by Dr. Kotsitsan at a uh, Evidence-Based Toxicology uh, Collaboration Consortium. Uh, that's based at CAT and Johns Hopkins. Uh, and, and this is a decent example, but you can think about some heavier weight uh, articles that you might want to review. You could use CISREV in reviewing grants, for example, and you might extract different information for why you accepted a grant and why you rejected a grant. Now, if, if, you know, if, uh, if a grant application gets rejected, that, that, that submitter can look at their grant and see exactly who reviewed it you know, see why they made the review, why they made the decision they made, really collect all that information. Uh, this, this level of transparency is really important in a time when people are trusting institutions less and less. Um, you know, it's not really enough to say, I'm this established institution, you have to trust me. Uh, people want to see the data behind that. And open access auditability enables that. Another ability that open access brings is solving replicability and reusability. Uh, we did a project with GESI, the Global Enabling Sustainability Initiative. Uh, and they were reviewing humanitarian evidence in conflict and war, certainly a noble cause. Uh, they wanted to 
replicate these labels, this, this, the data they were extracting across different data sets, uh, different sets of documents they were reviewing for this uh, conflict and war review. So they want to know, you know, was this talking about mig was this talking about migrants or refugees? And they want to use the exact same terms in another review. So Sysrev allows you to clone your reviews. And Gessie actually did this eight times with eight different groups of reviewers, eight different sets of articles, all with the exact same labels. So everything can be compared across each review process. Um, cloning lets you do a lot of really interesting things. Uh, if you're interested in the data source somebody reviewed, you can clone that data source. Uh, if you want to reuse their labels, you can do that. And uh, there should be a lot more interesting stuff coming there. So just stay, pay, pay attention to blog.sysrev or follow us and be able to see when that comes out. And Sysrev is also generalizing this process. Uh, so we really don't want to restrict ourselves just to academic review. Uh, we really think review plays a role in many different fields. I mean, the word is even used in various domains like legal review, patent review, really any case where you, you need to look at evidence and make decisions. That's a review process. So how do we generalize this process? Well, already Sysrev allows you to import citation information in the form of IRS or EndNote exports. You can upload PDFs. Um, and uh, one of our mini grant winners, Eliza Grames, who's reviewing insect populations, you can go to her project and download her EndNote file to see exactly what documents she's reviewing uh, to track uh, insect population trends. Uh, we also integrate PubMed directly. So you can do a search on PubMed and uh, everyone can see exactly what search you ran and run it themselves um, and you know, reproduce it that way. Uh, we're actually introducing, introducing uh, clinicaltrials.gov fairly soon. We're looking for beta partners on that. If you'd like to run a review on clinicaltrials.gov, please talk to us. Um, let's see if I can pull up an example for you. So this is our staging site. Uh, and here you can see I'm doing a review of breast cancer. If I go to manage, you can see the data source right here is tt.gov, so clinicaltrials.gov, and this search was on breast cancer. If I go to clinicaltrials.gov beta, I can do a search on breast cancer vitamin C, and you can see I find 20 articles, and I can see some information about those articles before I import them. Now I can also control which information in that clinical trial is viewed by my reviewers. In this case, I'm reviewing detailed descriptions from clinicaltrials.gov and brief summaries. So you can see a whole lot of text here and a lot of information people would start extracting uh, from these documents. So the question comes up, why do we integrate clinicaltrials.gov and other data sources directly? Why don't we just let people upload their own information? Uh, this is the subject of provenance. Really what we want to be able to say is, you know, clinicaltrials.gov is, the, is the, the root source of all these documents and they assign identifiers to these documents. So now if one person reviews some set of articles in clinicaltrials.gov, and, and another person reviews a different set of documents, we can compare their processes. And we can, in the cases where they review the same clinical trials, we can combine that data. Uh, going back to our example of 1,000 reviews on lead, you can really see how that would reduce redundant work if people are extracting the same kind of information from the same kind of documents. But we need to be able to know where those documents are coming from. Of course, integrating data sources directly is also valuable just because it's difficult to extract information from public data sources. You know, you, there, there is a process of extracting, transforming, and loading data, and uh, we can make that much easier for people and allow more people to do reviews on those data sources. A, uh, a production example of reviewing clinical trials is something we did with Dr. Channing Peller. Again, um, she was interested in reviewing vitamin C and cancer therapy, cancer combination therapies, and uh, she extracted a lot of information on which drugs uh, vitamin C is being used with, safety and toxicity, administration methods, all of that. I can't share the results because it's getting published soon, but the gist of it is, is that vitamin C is being used more and more for more therapies and in combination with many different drugs. Um, it was really a thrill learning about how, how these therapies are transforming over time through this project. You can also upload safety data sheets. So, and you can upload any PDFs you have. Uh, we work with a group called Sustainable Research Group uh, that reviews SDS, SDSs to help people with their regulatory concerns. And you can see they worked with Ed Taylor at, uh, at Environamics, and he was really pleased that, you know, you could use this process at different places with many people, and it's easy and verifiable and inexpensive. So those are kind of research-oriented projects. I thought another fun one to look at is, uh, is you know, other use cases. You can really create, get creative with review. Um, so I was planning on going to the Society of Toxicology Conference. Uh, I don't know if many people are familiar with that one here, but it's a, well, it's a toxicology conference. It's very relevant to the kind of work I do. 
So I, I figured out, you know, what are all the comp companies that go to this conference? Uh, what are their descriptions and what are their booths? So I can go talk to them. Uh, and then I can cluster those companies and, you know, I can see, you know, key uh, examples of each of these companies. That's sort of a data science side of this, but I also can just start reviewing those companies. Um, so if I go here, you can see I set up a review of, uh, of companies and some information about those companies, including descriptions. And now I can start saying, this is a company I want to go talk to. This is one I don't want to talk to. I can also recruit a team of reviewers for my, for my group and ask them to review those companies and figure out who they want to talk to, who they don't want to talk to, you know, which ones are the best fit for us. That to use a review process for, you know, determining who to talk to at a conference. Very simple use case. Keep going. Two more topics to talk about, just uh, automation and uh, concordance. Oh, we might have a little one at the end there as well. So automation, Cicero plugs machine learning into every step of the process of review. Uh, it does this in a somewhat unique prioritization method. Uh, humans label documents to perform these labeling processes on their documents that they're reviewing. The machine behind that, the server is learning how to replicate that process and comes back and orders human review to maximize the rate of learning. Um, so it's a very greedy machine. It wants to learn the most new information possible all the time. Behind the scenes, this works by featurizing every document, every text document. Uh, we hope to work with images and other things in the future, but for now we're constrained to text. Uh, so we featurize those documents uh, with something called Doctivec, and it's been trained in a very complex manner. You can learn all about that at blog.sysrev.com slash machine learning. We plug that into a multitask neural network. And at the end of the day, you get a model that predicts things uh, after people have reviewed about 25 articles. Um, we're very transparent about those results. So if you look at the ARIS reviews, that surgical group that does reviews on CISREV, uh, you can see the models work very well for them. But the models don't always work very well. And in fact, anyone who tells you that they have models that work perfectly for any review task is certainly lying to you. It's very trivial to come up with a review uh, where, where it's impossible to create a good model. Just have two reviewers who always disagree with each other. Um, so being able to view how accurate your model is, uh, is really important for determining whether you can trust that model for a certain, for a certain use case. You can also use these models to start building named entity recognition models. I'm not get into that in a minute. Uh, we wanted to run a process uh, where we extracted genes from literature. We eventually wanted to make a model to automate that process. I'll show you why in a minute. Um, the reason we picked this project was to test the payment platform on CISREV. So CISREV allows you to pay people for review. Uh, and there was an existing gene extraction project called BioCreative that reviewed about 10,000 sentences. So we asked how quickly can re we review 10,000 sentences if we pay people to do it? This project got completed in about two weeks and we paid people about a dollar per abstract that they looked at. And here you can see the process of them, uh, of them extracting a gene from some text. Uh, the, the user interface on this has improved a little bit since this slide was made. After this is done on 10,000 sentences, we can create a model that automates this process. The model's not perfect, but you know, it, it gives us something that we can automate and scale up. We can run that model on all the longevity literature, and we can get a list of genes, sort of a lamppost of, of which genes are published on most, most often in the context of longevity. Cynthia Kenyon, a researcher at Calico Labs, gave a TED talk on, uh, on longevity research. Um, that's what she does. And a lot of those same genes show up in her, in her TED talk. It's one of my favorites. Once you have this algorithm, you can build downstream applications. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure why this auto completes the breast cancer dog, but I'll put a breast cancer in there and search. Um, it's going to pull a random selection of, of publications from PubMed run the model on all of those abstracts, and uh, you can see which genes are gonna show up. So if you're familiar with breast cancer, probably not surprised to see HER2 showing up near the top, BRCA1, BRCA2, EGFR. Now we have a useful tool that's built from data extracted in a review. Okay, concordance. So I talked about how these models can be used to integrate human intelligence. Um, there's a lot we can do once people start working in parallel. Um, and, and just to pause on that for, for just a second, uh, many of these review projects we have are quite important. Uh, and some of them only have a few people working on them in the review process. And that's really a little bit, a little bit puzzling uh, because if you have an important, an important review project, uh, review is something that can be 
paralyzed, parallelized quite easily. Uh, if you have 100 people who can perform that process, you can speed up the process almost 100 times. Um, so that, that idea of combining human intelligence, you get that automatically just from the review process. But you can do even better uh, by, by using algorithms to compare different reviewers and analyzing how they're performing on different tasks. Uh, there's a great project that illustrates this, the Hallmark and Key Characteristic Mapping Project by the National Institute of Environmental Science, Alexander Burrell and Nicole Kleinstroyer. Uh, they're reviewing uh, hallmarks, cancer hallmarks and documents. You can see they have things like genomic instability, sustaining proliferative effect, all of that kind of interesting stuff. And our models don't work that well on their project. Uh, and so that was really the first step that kicked off uh, the analytics that we do. So we have a application now that's in beta. There we go. And you can see the first thing we can look at is, uh, you know, there are 46 users, 21 labels, 86,000 articles. This is a beta application. It looks like there was a bug in inclusion for this presentation, it's too bad. But um, you can look at the label concordance and you can see, you know, organism is being extracted in this review. And organism means, you know, can reviewers determine whether an article is about rats or humans or mice? And uh, that's not such a hard task, but also Hallmark is being extracted in this review. And so it turns out that it's a little bit more difficult for these reviewers to extract whether an article is about angiogenesis or apoptosis or any of the other Hallmarks. So first of all, concordance can be useful for determining the, uh, how well defined your tasks are and how, how well your reviewers understand those tasks. But you can also compare reviewers to each other. So Alex Alexander Burrell is an administrator on this project. And he only has 60% overall concordance with other reviewers. But if we break that down to his individual uh, concordance with the reviewers, we can see that with some reviewers, his concordance is really low. Uh, and with others, like Nicole Kleinstrauer, the other administrator on this project, his concordance is really high is exactly what you would expect to see. Some reviewers maybe don't understand the task all that well, or there could be other problems that show up. Um, so you probably want to just have a discussion with those people, understand what's going on. Okay, so that's concordance. And the last thing I want to talk about is managed review. Uh, we started offering managed reviews this year. In a managed review, uh, you're going to have some sort of big extraction project that you want to work on. Uh, you could use a little help with it. Uh, we'll help you design a custom custom data extraction from whatever data sources you're interested in. We'll manage the process of defining tasks, recruiting reviewers, making sure they're on time uh, and paying them. Uh, we'll automate some of those tasks where possible and analyze the results. We have quite a few blog posts on this. Um, we did a case study on Mangiferin. If you go to blog.sysrev.com, you'll see a picture of mangoes. I suggest you click that if you're interested. Uh, Mangiferin is the substance that exists in mangoes. And uh, if you were doing one of these projects, you might want to learn, you know, maybe I'm interested in creating a supplement with, man, with mangiferin in it. You should probably learn something about it first. Uh, so we reviewed all the, all the PubMed documents with mangiferin. One of the things we asked our reviewers to extract was the disease. Uh, and so now we can combine some simple uh, analytics models uh, to, to start clustering those diseases. So we have a model that can cluster strings based on how those strings are used in text. Uh, so you can see things like high dash phi, a uh, high dash fat diet is very similar to high space fat diet uh, here at the top. Um, and obesity, insulin resistance are very similar. Uh, diabetes, you know, impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes is very similar to diabetes. Renal fibrosis is very similar to nephropathy and neuropathy. Um, so this kind of clustering of disease outcomes is just one interesting analysis you can do. Uh, if, you, if you choose a representative disease for each of these clusters, you can discover that uh, manchiferin is very associated with diabetes. So you know, maybe it helps to as a therapy or a supplement um, for diabetes. So that's, that's it for today. Um, CISREV is free. Public projects are open access. You can go ahead and try it out right now if you're interested. Here are a few projects that I randomly picked out, some that I like. Um, I like all of our projects, but did, did pick these. Uh, and yeah, that's it. If there are any questions, I can answer those now. Or if not, I uh, hope you've enjoyed the presentation.